So back like 9 or more months ago when I originally made my Adrian Senti Monster Theory video, I never really anticipated needing to make a part 2. And that was largely in part to me thinking that the theory wasn't going to get any more major evidence, because I honestly wasn't confident that this was the direction that the show was headed in. Like, yeah, the backing is there. But I was trying to be realistic in that I didn't believe that we could get this in a show where the target demographic is preschoolers. But season 4 decided that, no, we are vastly underestimating it for thinking that it's just a cool theory. Because here we are like 5 suggestive ring touches later, the fandom in shambles, and myself completely convinced that this theory has now all but been confirmed at this point. Somebody compared it to the Rose's Pink Diamond theory, and honestly, I would say that's probably the most accurate comparison that you could ever have while trying to explain the reaction to it. First off, and this goes without saying, but if you haven't seen my part 1 to this video, it'll probably be a good idea to watch that one first. While a lot of my theory has changed and is no longer accurate to my current predictions, the base evidence has largely stayed the same. So to save on time, I'm not going to cover what I did in that video as in depth as I did previously. It's also a nice introduction to the theory since that video was written and made pre-season 4, so you can kind of have an understanding of where that evidence was at that point in time and why this theory has risen so quickly in the fandom space. And also, as a quick disclaimer, while not the focus of this video, I am going to be discussing the topic of abuse. And more specifically, I'm going to be briefly addressing Gabriel's abuse of his son Adrian. So if this is a triggering topic for you, I would suggest maybe skipping out on this video. And I know that you guys have been waiting for a full analysis video on that topic, and I promise that it is going to happen, especially since I have a very personal connection to Adrian's experience. It's just that currently I'm waiting for this arc to end. I honestly feel like especially with this senti monster stuff, I need to wait until Gabriel's time as Hawkmoth ends in order to make a proper analysis. It is coming though, and it's one of those videos that I'm really passionate about making. I just want to make sure that I'm doing it correctly, and unfortunately, that means waiting for more of the show to air. Okay, so a quick recap of the evidence that I presented in my last video, just as a refresher as well as ensuring that everyone is on the same page starting off. The basis of this theory is that Emily Agrest, previously known as Emily Graham Devanily, before marriage, wasn't able to have children. Because of this, her and Gabriel looked for a way to have a baby beyond their biological limits. This is when she and her husband stumbled upon the Miraculous while on a trip to Tibet and learned of their magical properties. The two Miraculous that they came into the possession of were the Miraculous of Transmission and the Miraculous of Emotion, otherwise known as the Butterfly and Peacock Miraculous. So far, the reason why they were looking for these magical pieces of jewelry is unconfirmed, and the mentioned motive is speculation. However, it isn't unfounded, believe it or not. Something that the fandom has been overlooking for a long time now, at least in a more analytical sense, is that a lot of the art and structures seen throughout the show are references to real-life locations and art pieces in France. Obviously, you have the Eiffel Tower, but you also have central locations such as the Louvre and the Scene, which are featured rather frequently within the show as primary settings. Even Gabriel himself is a reference to the famous French artist Gabriel Coco Chanel, who created the French designer brand Chanel. It's actually incredibly interesting, but that's besides the point. That is to say that there's likely other comparisons that one may overlook, even if they give us hints as to where the story is headed. One such little piece of information has actually been directly in front of us, to the point that I'm surprised no one pointed it out sooner. I'm of course referring to the portrait of Emily that guards the entrance to the Agrest Mansion's secret basement. The portrait itself is actually a reference to the famous painting The Woman in Gold, which is a portrait of the late Adele Bloch Bure. There's a lot of interesting history behind this painting, and I would recommend researching it yourself if you're an art history nut like myself, but the basics of what you need to know is that Adele herself is a woman who could not have children. She tried several times, but was tragically unsuccessful. While not encompassing her identity as a whole, as she was also a well-known art patron and philanthropist, the fact is important to the theory. It's important to note that Gabrielle Chanel was also childless and unmarried, though she did look after her nephew when her sister passed away unexpectedly. So if these are indeed the people that Gabriel and Emily were based off during their creation as characters, the reasoning for wanting to use the miraculous in their favor becomes all the more apparent. If Emily was indeed barren and wanted children, it wasn't like they didn't have the money at their disposal to find a way around that roadblock. We know from the New York and Shanghai specials that if you have connections with the correct people, it's possible to find out about these magical items and their locations. 
it's very likely that while searching for a way to have children of their own, through their money and influence, they found out about the miraculous. A magical piece of jewelry that could grant their wish and give them a child. And of course, because the complete and comprehensive documentation of magical abilities was lost when the temple burned down due to feast, they couldn't have known about the danger associated. This leads into territory that I briefly covered in my previous video, but we know for certain at this point that Emily's sickness was caused by using the Peacock Miraculous. Natalie and the consequence of her becoming Mayora is the biggest piece of evidence. As according to both Gabriel and Adrian, the side effects to using it is verbatim what happened to Emily leading up to her disappearance. Dizzy spells, coughing, fainting, and in general being unwell to the point of being bedbound. Adrian even remarks that Natalie's symptoms are eerily similar, and seems incredibly distressed over the very obvious parallels between his mother and his father's assistant. Not only in their symptomatic displays, but also through Gabriel's handling of the situation. This more or less confirms that Emily Agrest was the holder of the Peacock Miraculous before Natalie was. However, this is all just a very brief explanation. Again, I go over this with more and additional evidence in the previous video. This means that we know for certain that her disappearance and or death is tied to the Miraculous, more specifically, the Peacock Miraculous, which, as we all know, is responsible for the creation of Senti Monsters. Senti Monsters are beings that are created when somebody holds sentimental attachment towards someone or something. The amok, or the feather that we see, is then magically attached to an item and given physical form separate from it. As seen in the episodes Gabriel Agrest, Ladybug, and Optigami, senti monsters can also resemble and act like an already existing individual. So that's how you get senti Nino, senti Bug, and senti Moth. All of these senti monsters look like pre-existing individuals and are nearly impossible to distinguish from their human counterparts. The only thing that gives them away is how they behave as they are their own beings and cannot replicate the personality of another. At least, not for an extended period of time that's believable. We saw this more in the episode Ladybug than the others, as Sentibug was her own person and very clearly capable of making her own decisions when she was allowed. For example, she willingly chooses to ally with Ladybug and Cat Noir, betraying Miora and Hawkmoth in the process. Senti monsters possess free will as long as they are either in possession of their own amok or as long as nobody is actively using their amok to influence them. This is why Senti Bug was able to choose sides once Ladybug retrieved the Eiffel Tower keychain, which was the item that she was tied to. However, the holder of the Peacock Miraculous always possesses the ability to snap the Senti monster out of existence at any given time. This puts these beings at the mercy of whoever holds the Peacock Miraculous or whoever holds the item in which their amok is tied to. Whoever is in the position of authority therefore has overwhelming influence, making it nearly impossible for control to be broken or dissuaded without outside assistance. In terms of its significance to the story, senti monsters are very much meant to be an allegory to abuse and abusive relationships. And I'll get into why in a whole different video, but thematically it makes sense for Adrian's arc to be tied to this one particular piece of lore. We don't need an allegory to recognize that Gabriel is an abusive parent. This is just meant to give a physical representation of what his abuse is like. I've covered this in my In Defense and Cat Noir video, but Gabriel consistently manipulates and gaslights Adrian to the point of him having incredibly low self-esteem issues and overwhelming anxiety. But thematics aside, this explains a lot about his characters as well as another's. Throughout season four, we've seen senti monsters utilized more and more often in increasingly complex ways. In Optigami, Gabriel creates a senti monster to take Nino's place after he's been captured, then fools Alia into giving him the turtle miraculous. This piece of lore reveals that senti monsters can indeed use a miraculous to transform, despite being made of magic themselves. While it's likely that this was just a way to increase the stakes and show how Shadow Moth's powers are developing alongside Ladybugs, I think it may also be a setup into covering potential plot holes and leaving breadcrumbs to Adrian being a senti monster. I know that one of the biggest arguments against this theory initially was asking how he could possibly be Cat Noir if he also was made from magic of a miraculous at the same time. This episode shows that yes, it is possible. In fact, there's still a lot that we don't know whether it is or is not possible, so these episodes are likely laying the groundwork to lead us to the same conclusion. We also have the episode Wishmaker, which seems like it was a breaking point for most of the fandom regarding whether or not they believed this theory. Twitter was blowing up when this episode initially aired, and for good reason. The premise of this episode is simple. There's an akumatized victim who's upset that they never got to be what they wanted to be when they were a child, and so their power is to make it possible for their victims to live their childhood dream. 
Marina automatically remembers that she wanted to be the knitting fairy when she grew up, and the rest of the cast and incidentals also recall what they wanted to be when they were children. However, there is one person who can't remember. That person, as you can infer at that point, is Adrian. While trying to figure out a plan with Ladybug on how to save the day, Kat admits that he can't remember what his childhood dream was. And try as he might, he becomes increasingly more and more frustrated with himself to the point of allowing Wishmaker to use his power on him. It's then revealed that Adrian's wish when he was younger was to be what his parents wanted him to be. Okay, so yeah, it's not really subtle at all at this point. What Adrian's parents wanted him to be was their son. That's the purpose that he would have been created for had he been made deliberately and through alternative methods. So it would make sense if, as his dream, he wanted to fulfill the purpose that he was made to fill as a magical being. And given that senti monsters are sentimental beings made from the emotions of their creators, it would make sense that from the very beginning, Adrian felt the need to fill that role within his parents' lives. He just didn't remember since it was likely his desire from when he was first born, and that was well over a decade ago. Nobody said that being made from magic gave you the world's best memory, after all. But if all subtlety was lost in Wishmaker, then the upcoming evidence is like shoving a giant confirmed sign in somebody's face repeatedly until they're just... Right, I get it! So, Ephemeral certainly was... well... it was something. <laughs> While frustrating overall with the usual back and forth that this series tends to tiptoe, it did give a very few obvious in-your-face moments in terms of theory evidence. After the episode Mega Leech, Gabriel just kinda started going ham on touching the ring whenever he's telling Adrian to do something that he doesn't want to do. And honestly, it kind of feels like trolling at this point. And I know that it isn't, but also like, <laughs> Gabriel, we get it. You're a horrible father who is manipulating his son. Calm down a little. <laughs> Jokes aside, in the episode Ephemeral, there are several moments where Gabriel goes to touch his wedding band when he's giving Adrian orders. If you recall in my previous video, I theorized that Adrian's muck is likely residing in one of the Graham Devanelli family rings, specifically within Emily's. Since Felix stole Gabriel's and Gabriel is now wearing his late wife's, it would stand to reason that if he still has control over Adrian, that would mean his amok is in that ring rather than the one that Felix now possesses. And this would track, considering that Gabriel didn't really start doing the menacing ring touch until after he swapped rings. And we know that this isn't just something Gabriel does when he's nervous, because emphasis is placed on it rather heavily on two occasions within this episode. Once while in the start, while Gabriel is simply telling him to take the lead on a fashion event, and second when he's about to akumatize Adrian after he's lured him into the basement. In the first, the ring is obviously visible and on Gabriel's finger. You can physically see him toying with it, and so in this case, yes. It could simply be played off as an action or quirk that Gabriel has when in relation to manipulating his son. Could it be due to guilt, and him being upset that he needs to continually lie to him in order to keep his identity a secret? I mean... I guess. He does show some amount of remorse in the episode Felix for keeping this a secret from him, but it's very short-lived. However, he also does this when he's transformed as Shadow Moth. And this is where it gets interesting because you can't see the ring on Shadow Moth's finger, yet he still touches it. So there's nothing for him to fiddle with here in case of a quirk associated with a specific action, yet he's still doing the movement regardless. This would imply that the ring is there, just veiled and hidden within the magic of Shadow Moth's transformation. But this also would imply that the reason he's touching the ring that is no longer visible or tangible is because he has to in order to get the desired outcome. If he didn't, it would be very possible that Adrian could and would break his father's akumatization over him. After all, he did put up more of a fight in Cat Blanc than he did in this episode, and that was likely largely in part due to Gabriel having more control over him in this specific instance. After all, there was no ring manipulation in Cat Blanc, just emotional manipulation, which doesn't make it any better. It also seemed like he struggled until he was abruptly stopped from doing so and gave up. Even when he becomes ephemeral and Marinette calls out for help, he's unable to help her or even entertain the idea of swapping sides. And we know that Shadamoth does hold a very strong influence over his victims, but it wouldn't be unbelievable to have somebody break through his control, as it has happened multiple times before, namely with Nino and Chloe. And even beyond that, it's even more common for his victims to attempt to fight back and control their own actions, such as with Nathaniel in the episode of Illustrator. 
However, there was virtually no fighting back on Adrian's end, which again was odd as within Cat Blanc we did see him put up more of a fight and try to make his own decisions. Well, at least to an extent. I mean, I'm sure he didn't choose to destroy the moon and all of Paris, but he also made a conscious decision to attempt to cataclysm himself rather than his father or ladybug like he was being told to do, which is dark, but you know, that's just how this show is sometimes. So this brings us to the most interesting episode of the bunch and where a lot of this theory starts to come together, Gabriel Agrest. Now, if there is one episode that you can point to it and say, this is it, this is the moment where this theory was confirmed, it's this episode. Forget having a sign shoved in your face, this is straight up hitting you over the head with Thor's hammer. <laughs> like, I cannot express to you how blatantly obvious this is, and if it isn't what it's confirming, it's 100% an intentional red herring. Just... just listen. <laughs> I knew you were no ordinary uncle. And now you know that I only need to snap my fingers to make you disappear from here. You wouldn't dare. Do you want to take that risk, Felix? Think of your mother. Hmm, that certainly sounds like a not-so-subtle threat. Sure do wonder where the idea of snapping your fingers and disappearing came from. Sarcastic jabber aside, this more or less confirms that something is going on within the Agrest and Graham de Vanilly households. There's a secret that both of these families are hiding, and the rings are the key to finding out exactly what that secret is. And while it may just seem like Felix is a side character that is meant to pay homage to the old PMV, it's rather obvious at this point that that isn't the case. In fact, Felix's role is becoming more and more integral, and this episode is only the start of his involvement. And if you couldn't guess at this point by the title and very obvious buildup, I strongly believe that Felix is also a senti monster. I guess you could also technically call him Adrian's twin brother, it's, it's a whole thing, just let me explain. So going back more towards the beginning of this video where I talked about it being heavily implied that Emily was barren, we know that she and her sister Amelie, who is Felix's mother, are identical twins. It's very possible that due to sharing the same genetics, Amelie is also barren and unable to have biological children. We also know that canonically, Felix's father died rather recently, around the same time that Emily disappeared. And while it was obvious from the start that Felix and Adrian are meant to be foils from a narrative standpoint, I think it perhaps goes even deeper than that, though along the same lines. Felix stole Gabriel's ring, which likely means that if he is also a senti monster, the ring he now possesses is where his amok is being contained, which also means that he has the ability to be rebellious and act out in turn, since Gabriel has no way of controlling him. We know that Adrian's amok is likely in his mother's ring, and Felix is likely in the ring Gabriel wore before it was stolen. A senti monster is made from the sentimental feelings and attachment that an individual has towards an item, person, event, etc. So, wouldn't it make sense if the reason Adrian and Felix are so different in personality is because of whose ring they were attached to, and therefore whose emotions they were made from? If you think about it, Adrian has a lot in common with Emily, whereas Felix has more in common with Gabriel. Felix isn't necessarily nefarious, but he is very good at manipulating situations and individuals like Gabriel is. He's incredibly smart being the first to figure out his uncle's identity with ease, and he's also a lot more reserved than Adrian is, at least when it comes to showing his emotions. Whereas on the opposite side of the spectrum, Adrian can be hot-headed, irrational due to acting impulsively on his emotions, and always tries to see the best in people, which is what allows him to be easily manipulated. Felix tends to act on logic, whereas Adrian tends to act on emotion. We don't know much about Emily, but it would make sense if their varying personalities were due to the holder of the item in which they were attached to. Felix taking more after Gabriel, and Adrian taking more after Emily. Felix isn't cold-hearted, but he also shows affection differently in as much much more guarded like Gabriel is. There's still love there and he was still made from love, it's just from somebody who expresses it and feels it differently. And then you have Adrian who's outspoken and overflowing with a different kind of love and affection and that emotion is also expressed and felt differently. So if this theory is correct, this would also make Felix Adrian's twin brother, similar to how Emily and Amelie are twin sisters. So here's what I think happens now being given new information from these episodes. Sisters Emily Agrest and Amelie Graham de Vanily are twin sisters who, due to health issues that they both possessed, were unable to have children. Emily wanted to be a mother, and so with their combined excessive wealth, she and Gabriel searched for alternative methods to having a child together. 
This is when they stumbled across the Miraculous, which were rumored to give the wearer the ability to create living beings for magic. However, due to the loss of knowledge when the Temple of the Guardians was destroyed due to Fu's mishap as a child, knowledge on proper usage of those tools and their Kwame was lost. Emily used the Miraculous to create her and Gabriel's son, Adrian. She attached his amok to her wedding ring since her desire was to have a child with the man who she was married to. Adrian, being a senti monster created with the sole purpose to be their child, resembled an ordinary human in every way. He could age, get sick, be allergic to things, and live an ordinary life in which they could watch him grow up. The only difference between him and an ordinary non-magical human child would be the circumstance of their birth. Amelie either would have learned of Adrian's birth or been told of it before it happened, and would have questions about how her sister managed to have a child since they both suffered from the same condition. This is where Emily would have told her about the Peacock Miraculous and how it made it possible for her to have Adrian. Being in a similar position and wanting a child of her own, the Miraculous was used again to create Felix. This time, Gabriel's ring was used to house the Amok. That's what gave the two rings the nickname the Graham Devanelli Twin Rings, and also the story behind their significance that Amelie briefly mentioned at the end of the episode, Felix. Keep it. It's yours now. But you wanted it so much. Only to give it to you. You've always been so fascinated by them. How many times have you asked me to tell you the story of the Graham Devanelli Twin Rings, huh? However, for whatever reason, the Peacock Miraculous was broken. Whether it was due to Emily's unknowing misuse that caused it to break or the misuse of an owner prior to her is unclear. The creation of Adrian with a broken Miraculous is what caused her to fall ill and eventually end up killing her. It's very possible that the same exact thing happened to Felix's father had he been involved in Felix's creation. Considering that he died shortly after Emily did, it would make sense if these two events were closely intertwined and somehow connected. There will be no more Catalyst or Mayora. I warned you, using a broken Miraculous ends up breaking its wearer. The wounds on the Miraculous are becoming your wounds. Never at that cost again. My mom used to have dizzy spells, just like Natalie. My father said those weren't serious either. So this leaves us where we currently are in the canon. Felix is now in possession of his own amok, and is acting out on his own and trying to expose Gabriel as Hawk Moth. He has full control of himself, as Gabriel no longer has influence over him. Gabriel is also now in possession of Adrian's amok, and is using it to influence and control his actions, so he becomes more rebellious as time marches on and his father's true nature is exposed to him. He was relying on emotional manipulation strictly before this point, but now that it's not enough to keep him in line, he's resorting to other far more unconventional methods. He's also desperate to get the ring back that Felix stole, hinting at it bearing more than simple sentimental value. Felix is dangerous, and Gabriel is more aware of just how much of a threat he actually is. That also begs the question on whether or not Felix is aware of how he was created. He seems very close to his mother, and it's implied that she's told him whatever story there is to be told about the rings. And while the terms Miraculous and Senti Monster likely weren't used, Felix is smart enough to put two and two together, which is also what leads into him discovering Shadow Moth's identity. Gabriel has also likely figured out that he knows something is up, considering he was very specific in the threat that he gave. I mean, he literally told him that he could snap his fingers and be rid of him. And while one could take that as a threat of him hiring a hitman, which Gabriel is not above because he's done it before, he was being very descriptive with his threat on purpose. He knows that Felix is smart and hot on his trail, and so scaring him into behaving is the last method of manipulation that he possesses against him. Unlike the control that he has over Adrian, he does not have that influence over Felix. That also does beg the question on how Amelie wouldn't also put two and two together with Gabriel being Hawk Moth, but it's likely she's afraid of what he would do to Felix if she did tell. After all, Gabriel does have the power to snap Felix out of existence at any time he wants. He just doesn't because he knows that it would automatically reveal his identity if he did. And Gabriel knows that it wouldn't be wise to play all the cards in his hand at once. It's also possible that Amelie is only aware of the aggressive possession of the Peacock Miraculous and not the Butterfly Miraculous, in turn not automatically registering to her that her brother-in-law is the Scourge of Paris. There's also a collection of other small bits and pieces of evidence, but I decided it'd be a better idea to leave them until the end so they didn't saturate the rest of this video. So here's a few other things that I've noticed throughout the season that also perhaps foreshadow Adrian's identity as a senti monster. 
In the episode Mega Leech, which I briefly mentioned, Gabriel is seen touching his ring after scolding Adrian for disobeying him. This is the first instance in which this behavior becomes repetitive and commonplace in Gabriel and Adrian's interactions. You took a stand against me today. I didn't take a stand against you, father. I took a stand against a project that my friend showed me was bad for Paris and for the planet. Adrian, go to your room. Yes, father. In the episode Gabriel Aggressed, Gabriel refers to the senti monster of himself as perfect, which if you remember in my last video, is a common word that's been used on multiple occasions to describe both Adrian and other senti monsters. Isn't he flawless? What? Uh, what? Flaw what? Adrian, my son, he's the image of perfection, don't you think? Oh yes, he's perfect. Uh, Adrian is a model for his father, Gabriel Agress, the best fashion designer in Paris, and probably the world. But he never brags about it, because he's perfect. Uh-huh, she's a senti monster. But she's so much more elaborate than any of those we faced before. She's so perfect, there's nothing monstrous about her at all. Sorry, Katie, but you should have known. I'm nowhere near as perfect as her. This is really you. Do you really think? Yes, you're perfect. You're perfect. In the episode Party Crasher, Gabriel briefly refers to a mistake that he and Emily made, presumably the one that also led to her premature death. It's strongly implied that this mistake involves the miraculous, therefore also heavily implying that Gabriel is referring to Adrian as the mistake in question. Way to go, Gabriel. Thanks to my Akumas, it's only a matter of time before I take control of their miraculous. Merging them will grant me absolute power to reshape reality and finally reverse our past mistake. I believe that's it in terms of new evidence for now, but I did also want to comment on some of the problems that you guys had with this theory in the last video. The major one, and the one that I saw commented the most, were folks asking how if this was true, how come Natalie couldn't sense that Cat Noir was a senti monster? And I think that this is a very valid question, and it's one that I've needed to think about a lot. While I think that Natalie is well aware that Adrian himself is a senti monster, I don't believe that she knows that Cat Noir is one. If she did, obviously his cover would have been blown the moment she wore the Miraculous. But I also think that what Natalie is able to sense is magical aura, just like Aeon is able to when Mike Rochip is akumatized and being influenced by Hawkmoth. So if she can't tell what type of magic is there, just that it's magic, it would make sense that she wouldn't know that Cat Noir is a senti monster, because you know, she's sensing the magic of Plague. And since we know at this point that it is possible for magical beings such as senti monsters to use a miraculous, that wouldn't be contradicting any in-show lore that's currently been established. It's also possible that Natalie can only sense a mux, which in Adrian's case would also make Cat Noir immune from ever being found out in that way since he isn't in possession of his amok and Gabriel is. There was also the point being brought up on whether or not senti monsters can age or get sick since Adrian has done both of these things. And the truth is, we don't have any in-show evidence to prove that it's possible or not possible at this point. However, we do have evidence from Thomas's Twitter that leans more on the side of these things being entirely plausible. In the above tweets from July, Thomas states that if Senti Bug ever had the chance to grow up and have a life of her own, it would be possible for her to have children. And while the children part isn't significant here, the usage of the term grow up is. And in another tweet when talking about using the Peacock Miraculous for good, Thomas also had this to say. So we know that it's possible and may have been done in the past to create a being artificially for them to fall in love and have their own life outside of their original intended purpose. At least, uh, according to Twitter. Though I would take Twitter confirmation with a grain of salt considering there's been, well, Twitter is Twitter. So the best thing that we can do, honestly, is just wait and see whether or not the canonical evidence proves or disproves this theory. I have a feeling, or at least I'm hoping, that this mystery will be solved sooner rather than later. And if Gloob has anything to say about it, they'll probably spoil it before the title of the episode is even released. That said, I'm very interested to know your thoughts on this theory. I know at the time that my first video on this came out, most folks were on the side of it being false. But with all of this additional evidence, I'm curious to see how many opinions have changed. And if you'd like to see more videos like this in the future, please consider subscribing and hitting that bell icon to be notified of when I upload. Special thank you to my top tier patrons. Ambrose Rothwood, Jeffy Games, Brandon Nunes, The Lovely Ghosty, Sodden Suzuki, Charlotte Allen, Lee Taylor, and Zachary Ansley. Because of people like them, I can continue to make content like this. And I hope to see you all in the next video.
Have an amazing day, guys.